Hey, everybody. It is Paragraphs and Power Chords. I am your host, Christoph Paul. I got my podcast voice and I got, I'm, this is just cool. I'm, I'm a horror and a rock nerd, as many of you know, and I got, I got John Skip. I'm, I'm talking to John Skip. There he is. The Hi. People who are viewing it and are, are listening. He's waving. And, you know, why don't you just, I, I'd like you to introduce yourself because I, I know and the fans know for maybe some of the people who don't know John Skip who are curious, what, tell them a little bit about yourself, Skip. Hello, I'm, I'm John and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> You're supposed to say, hi, John. Hi, John. Um, um, I don't know, man. Uh, I have been making up crazy shit my whole life and um, um, music has always been part of it. Yeah. Stories have always been part of it. Um, I used to love to draw when I was a kid. I had a terrible uh, teacher in eighth grade who beat all the fun out of uh, uh, visual arts for me, but I dropped out of that class and went into theater where I wound up like writing the school play and uh, doing music and performing and stuff like that. So uh, it's all one contiguous media, right? Uh, you know, in, in multiple forms, but um, you know, I, I wrote a bunch of horror novels in the 80s and 90s, and uh, the funny word splatterpunk was yeah, in, you're kind of the, around the, that shit. The um, godfather of splatterpunk, as a lot of people say. I'm one of them. Yeah. I'm an, I'm an OG. OG splatterpunk uh, writer. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I started selling stories to Twilight Zone magazine in the early 80s when I first moved to New York and I was writing on an old Smith Corona. Yeah. Uh, uh, typewriter but meanwhile I was also playing in a in a New York band called Elixir uh, with a guy named uh, uh, George Conrad who had a, a, a bald cap he, he was like Nosferatu with big boobs cool and, and <laughs> that, that paints the picture man that's a, that's oh, interesting it, it was amazing he was really brilliant he had a voice like Peter Gabriel and he wrote mm. songs like uh, if Peter Gabriel was in Devo um that's cool whoa yeah it, it was really cool so um you know all of these things have been have been part of the texture of my my life forever i've uh played in a lot of bands i love making movies more than almost anything because movies are where story and music and visual arts all come together with drama and actors and uh pulling a bunch of fun people together and making something crazy and collaborative that you couldn't do by yourself but uh, all of it is fucking cool, and I will be happy to discuss any of it you would like to discuss. Sweet, man. I mean, I think the thing I'm curious about, because, yeah, you really, you're not even a dual, you're like a tr triple artist. I don't even know the term for it, you know? Well, you're I like a lot of shit, actually. I relate, man. I love it, because it's like, I, I feel the same, that kind of same energy, because I love to just, like, I love to write, I love to do music, I love, and we're both, both editors and publishers as well. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. so it's like, I would, you know, I'd be interested to know kind of which art form grabbed you first, like in when you were like a kid. I'm, I'm really curious to always know which kind of grabbed you first, which was like the first one. Um, my first art hero was Dr. Seuss. Hmm. And I loved Dr. Seuss because I loved uh, the drawings but I also really loved the wordplay yeah. and how the two of them worked together and uh, you know, realizing how many of the words that he used, he made up. Um, yeah. And uh, so to me, uh, the ability to be artistically, artistically uh, flexible and, and, and playful and to make up your own roles was instituted immediately by Dr. Seuss. Hmm. Uh, who still remains a hero for me. Yeah. Um, then my next love was Warner Brothers cartoons, yeah. old Bugs Bunny and, and Daffy and like the really old Max Fleischer Popeyes where you never hear him say words. He's just muttering and punching, uh, you know, genies and stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, an art form where anything was possible and uh, everything was alive. And that was really, really inspiring. Um, but the first art form 
that I gravitated towards as a thing to do aside from, I always loved telling stories and I was telling stories from the very beginning. Uh, there are uh, kids I still know from elementary school who said that they knew I was gonna be a horror writer because I was writing horror stories when I was eight. Yeah, um, Same. that's interesting. Yeah, it's, it was my first thing too, was horror stories. But I also really loved to draw yeah. and I loved like creepy magazine. I would get creepy magazine and I would do these pages where I would just uh, do favorite panels from uh, from the different stories. So there'd be like some Wally Wood here and some Jerry Grandinetti here and some uh, um, d uh, Steve Ditko here, just the various artists that I was a fan of who were doing those crazy monster comics in the early 60s when I was a kid. Um, and I, I loved that shit. Um, then I got my first guitar. I think I was 10 mm. when I got my first guitar and I wrote my first song, you know, within days uh, of, of getting it. Uh, then I got my first electric guitar. I'm living in Argentina, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Yeah. And um, I really wanted an electric guitar. And there was this sunburst Stratocaster copy in the window of a record store mm -hmm. near the school that I went to. I had to take yeah. the train to school and I would walk past this record store every day. Uh, these were the old record stores where you would walk in. Uh, if there was an album you were interested in, they had a, a they had little listening rooms with a little player. You'd put the music on and you'd listen to the song and go, oh, I think this is cool. Uh, I think I might have to buy this record. And um, and they had like a couple of guitars hanging in the windows and I had to have this guitar. So my parents buy me this guitar. We bring it home, plug it in to our stereo amp. Our stereo amp was running on uh, US uh, currency, which I think is 110 uh, volts. Yeah. And, uh, and we had an adapter running at 220 uh, to work with the Argentine current. For some reason, plugged the guitar in and was instantly electrocuted. Holy shit. Oh, man. And so I'm like, nah. my hands are like frozen on the strings. My sister is laughing until she realized that maybe I was dying and then she unplugged the stereo. And, um, <laughs> and then I didn't die. Damn. And you would think that this might discourage me but no, we just got an Argentine amp that would run on the 220 currency. And then I started playing electric guitar. That's like um, a beautiful rock and roll story, right? There. <laughs> it's like a rock and roll baptism, you know, instead of oh. life, it's like, here, we're going to show you death and you're going to, you're going to now spend your time, you know, like creating to stop the death kind of thing. There's like, that's some deep shit, actually, man. That's kind of deep. That's the first first time with your electric guitar wow that's pretty cool and again i'm living in argentina where i was watching i mean i saw yeah. i saw my first people die in front of me within 10 minutes of leaving the airport i remember um, reading about this uh in the battle royale uh, yes yes uh, collection yeah. i think nick mama toss edited it but yeah it's a great collection by the way people check it out yes yeah. the, the, the battle royale slam book yes uh, and i i have uh uh, the opening essay, which I think was called something like uh, Death for Kids. Yes, yes. Um, I'm pretty sure. And, uh, and yeah, just talking about my childhood in Argentina and just, you know, seeing lots of death. So you put that together with my baptism by electrocution on the electric guitar uh, and, uh, and all that shit and drawing pictures from Creepy Magazine. It all, you know, I was pretty much well on um, my formative way as an artist by the time I was 10. That's pretty um, cool. No, and, and that makes sense. I mean, you just really lived it. We'll go into, you know, more of your future life, but that just like, that sounds right to me, knowing you for these, all these, you know, not that long, but like seven or eight yeah. years, like yeah. that makes sense that you were going to get rolling so soon and just throw yourself into it, you know? I so. knew what I liked. Yeah. And I still do. Yeah, that's, and that's a beautiful thing. That's a, that's a, you know, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I, I see it as a blessing. Some people see art, like being an artist as a curse sometimes. You see it, I'm, I think you see it as a blessing, I would think. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's both, but, yes, it is, there um, is but the glass is way more than half full. 
Yeah, definitely. You learn the fuck more than half full, even when I spill it. So yeah, I, I and, and there's a, there is a lot of spilling in making art. That's for damn sure. So yeah. so yeah, that's cool. So you start at like ten, and you just so you're writing stories and you're writing songs. I guess at this time through, through totally. your teenage your teenage life, that's kind of did that. Did you keep writing those stories in your teenage life and songs? How did it go in more you know post puberty, so to speak? Well, and I was also writing plays again. In, oh in wow. Grade, you know I I, I uh, cool. I, I quit my art class because the teacher was such an asshole and was yeah. sucking all the fun out of art to the point where I barely draw now. Yeah. Um, um, and it's all stunted at like that 13 year old level. I, I, my my yeah. art skills have not really gotten much further than like, here's an eyeball. Uh, but um, um, yeah, I mean, then played in bands, played in teenage bands. I, I met Craig Spector, who I wound up writing uh, uh, the spider punk stuff with. Yeah. Um, we was were he a musician high- as well, or was he just fellow writer? Um, he, w- we met at York Country Day School af- right after I had quit Central High School in, mm-hmm. um, in York, Pennsylvania, where I had wound up after leaving Argentina. And, and then- I have, to, I have to say one thing here. There is something really weird about York, Pennsylvania. I feel like we've all oh, talked shit. about this. I stayed there for like a month or two with my with an ex girlfriend. You you live there. I stayed in Shrewsbury, so I was like not far. Brian yeah. Keen, Jeff Burke. There's like a weird. Who else? Is there anybody else I'm missing? I feel that in that area, the York area. Well, I know a lot of freaks in that area, but in terms of uh, of writers, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and Jesus wound up there yes, uh, moving yes, from Los Angeles. Angeles now. Yeah. So it's so like, that is just, that just and Jeff an Cooper. interesting side note that that's just such a, that that's a place where these like people who would influence horror and shit would, would li- it's just kind of cool to me. I just, cause I, I live there and it's the most boring fucking weird place for me. For me I, think the, I think the reason that horror might uh, spring from there is because uh, many, many, uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, an evil meteor landed there. It planted itself oh, under the earth. I, I'm just, I'm just telling you from my personal experience that I think an <laughs> evil meteor landed there to, to I suck believe all the, to I suck believe all that the juice the, out of everybody it could. Yeah, I believe that the first second you said that, I'm like, oh, that makes total fucking sense. Yeah. Right. But anyway, sorry. So, no, no worries. Um, I mean, I know a lot of great people there. A lot of musicians there, wonderful yeah. musicians uh, and, and people I just dearly I wrote love. some songs there, man. I remember being just stuck there and I just went into the basement and worked on songs. Like they didn't, I think one ended up coming out of all that, that I ended up retooling like 10, whatever, how many years later. But yeah, Crazy. it works in an interesting place. But no, you mentioned um, Spectre and I, I, I think that's something I'm always fascinated in with the idea of like, there's a sports, sports term uh, they say you need the other guy, you know, mm-hmm. you need that, like just Kobe needed Shaq kind of thing. And, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I kind of really agree with that to some, and it's just on different levels. I really think art a lot of times is a collaborative effort. And I, that was one thing I definitely wanted to talk about with you because you've worked, you worked with somebody we both uh, also, you know, adore as an artist, Autumn Christian. I know you've, you've, I think published like two, stories together and you've worked on stuff so oh yeah no she's amazing collaborator yeah, she's awesome we're, one of my favorite people yeah um, but yeah let, 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 let's let's get to her chronologically yeah yeah um, but i'm curious I, about that that start the start of the the collaborative efforts because you have bands and specter and just how that played a role I'm, I'm very curious about that with you well basically i wound up at your country day school after i quit school i just uh i was always in trouble I was always fighting uh, with authority figures. There'd be like, uh, you know, the moment where um, the math teacher is picking on the the dumb guy in class, yeah. and I'm just like, okay, I uh, I know it's very easy uh, to to embarrass and humiliate Buddy. You want to try that shit with me? The next thing I know, I'm being dragged down to the office and stuff. <laughs> and I finally just went, you guys don't want me here. I don't want to be here. I'm out of here. And I yeah. quit. And my parents like freaked out. And I wound up, uh, because my dad uh, was in government, 
able to get into this little school, uh, school called York Country Day School. And my first day I go there and I'm wearing my, my black Parson suit with my black string tie and my top hat and my hair down to here. And I walk in and uh, do the tour. And then I go into the junior senior smoking lounge, which they had at this school. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this beautiful uh, young woman standing behind this couch and laughing and looking down at this long haired dude who's drawing something left handed. And I look down and it's like a, an R. Crumb character. It's like a flaky foot looking character. And I go, R. Crumb. And he goes, yeah, turns around like, who the fuck knows who R. Crumb is? <laughs> King Crimson's Lark's Tongue in Aspic is playing on the stereo. Uh, that's how I met Craig Spector. And um, he was the artist and uh, we became friends and just loved making shit up. I was playing music. I taught him to play guitar. Wow. That's and cool. then we would play together. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, wound up doing a band called the Philadelphia Children's Orchestra, which was so <laughs> named because cool nobody would rent like timpani or orchestra bells to a rock band. Yeah. But if you went in and said, we're the Philadelphia Children's Orchestra, then maybe you could get away with that shit. It's um, <laughs> pretty smart. We, we were like a, a, a weird prog rock band yeah. that was totally into like Crimson and Frank Zappa and Yes and uh, and um, just really trying to do the most ambitious music that we could. And we had like uh, a drummer, a percussionist, uh, synthesizers, Craig just, and I were on guitars. Just to get an idea, what what would be the time that this was happening? Was this the 60s, 70s? This would be 1974 this, to yeah. uh, 1976. That's a cool era. I, I love 70s, just rock in general, man. I mean, it, yeah. you know, you can hear it from the songs you've heard of mine. Like, I love that yeah. era. Um, that sounds really fun, what you guys were doing. I mean, that, that sounds very Frank Zappa, kind of, yeah. Yeah, I, I, we, we would do weird shit. Um, um, we had a, a, a 30 minute song called Suburbia with a, a slideshow with dissolved units that were showing weird images uh, behind us. Well, meanwhile, I was selling uh, cases of champion embalming fluid in negligee uh, <laughs> while, um, while um, uh, talking about turning my maid into an android to serve my every need. And yeah, we were just doing weird shit uh, we, we had a song, I had a song called Policeman's Balls that was like uh, uh, anger, angry anti-cop disco uh, funk and was kind of hilarious and used the- Anti-police awesome. disco sounds pretty awesome. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds fucking badass, actually. I would- I would a funked out that. version of the, the theme from Dragnet. And yeah, it was, it was, it was real uh, kind of, uh, fuck you weirdo music and yeah. um, and it was really funny because the bikers because there were lots of biker gangs around and when we would do like free concerts in the park we would do these be-ins and there'd be when we would play there'd be this row of bikers in the back just shaggy ass outlaws going skipper <laughs> you know, and I'm like 18 years old going wee, wee, wee. yeah uh, in a fucking top hat and negligee so um, yeah it was all weird it was cool um, but yeah, it wasn't, in, and we would collaborate, like I would write, we tried to sell a story to Creepy Magazine. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote a vampire story called Angelo's Angel of Mercy and yeah. he drew it and it, it never, it never happened, but, uh, yeah. that sort of let us know where we were going. And we we're watching, you know, we'd go to the drive-ins and see like a double, uh, no, a, 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 a quintuple feature of uh, uh, Beyond Atlantis, a terrible movie that you would never want to see. Impulse, which would be William Shatner uh, as a psychotic oh, yeah. serial killer. Yeah. Then Junior Bonner would come on a Sam Peck and Paul Western with Steve, a uh, uh, rodeo movie with uh, Steve McQueen. And then Night of the Living Dead and Texas Chainsaw would wrap it up. Um, so, you know, as the sun is coming up, uh, Marilyn Burns is uh, running towards the back of the truck and, and Leatherface is waving yeah. his, doing his chainsaw dance. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, 
it was a fun adolescence. And um, it's cool because I'm seeing like you guys are getting really into horror and doing weird shit in music, you know, and that's kind mm -hmm. of a foreshadowing of like what you of where it went. Be yeah. Doing. yeah, that's pretty cool. So then a bunch of other stuff happened, but um, when I wound up moving to New York City, and I think it was 1981, um, Craig was up in Boston uh, uh, going to uh, the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Yeah. And uh, so I'm writing fiction and meanwhile playing in that band Elixir I was telling you about with the guy with the boobs and, and the, yeah. uh, the bald head. Um, and um, I'm selling stories to Twilight Zone magazine writing on this uh, Smith Corona electric typewriter. Yeah. And uh, Craig calls me up one day and he said, hey, I got this idea for this uh, vampire story. Uh, you, you should write it, sell it to Twilight Zone magazine and we'll split the money. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got this other stuff I'm doing. Uh, but it was basically the bones of light at the end. He basically had, um, there's a punk vampire who sleeps in the subways in New York. That's his native soil. Uh, he had the chain snatching sequence that happens about halfway through the book. And he had the ending with the train chase going through uh, the tunnel and out in, toward, over, over the bridge into Brooklyn. And that's what he had. And um, then one weekend he comes down to New York. Uh, we went to my ex-girlfriend Leslie's apartment on the Bowery. Um, and in the course of, of one long drunk stone night, realized that it wasn't a short story it was a novel yeah and uh and i began to write it and i uh wrote for like the first year and it, whenever i had uh pages i would either mail them to him in boston or um or call him up and read them to him mm -hmm. and then he graduated from school and decided it was time to move down to new york so he came down got an apartment got a job at, at the same messenger service that i was i was a messenger on foot. He was on roller skates uh, going around New York City. Uh, we were both putting in about 20 miles a day. Uh, but being a messenger informed me. I got to know New York so yeah, well. You know, I got to know everywhere because I was in every building and down every street. And so that was all research and shit. And uh, finished writing the book. Um, and again, I wrote almost every word of that book. But yeah. we plotted it together like yeah. crazy. I mean, that's um, kind of what a lot of editors do. And agents will sometimes help you plot and edit. So yeah, that's cool. That's a great way to collab a book, in my opinion. It, it, it was really cool. And, and then, you know, um, everybody in town rejected it. Um, I got, you know, so many rejections. It's too bloody. There's too many characters. It's this, it's that. I also had written it in present tense. Um, mm. And so after... 10 different publishers going, you can't do this in present tense. Yeah. It's like, okay, I guess we'll have to change it into past tense, past, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I like present tense myself, but I do uh, too. But yeah, sometimes it, I mean, it's a great novel. I mean, obviously. So, yeah. So, um, so then because I had sold a couple of stories to Twilight Zone and Ted Klein, the, the, uh, the editor there, uh, had written me a, a little letter on Twilight Zone stationery that says, I commend to your attention the uh, uh, John Skip, a young writer of unusual talent. I have purchased several of his stories and look forward to, to doing more, uh, Ted Klein. Then Ted sold his first novel um, to um, Bantam Books for $100,000. Yeah. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> well, they like Ted, Ted likes me, Maybe they'll like me. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, the ceremonies was the name of the book, and uh, so I wrote a one-page query letter, which was the query letter I'd basically been sending out, which is uh, dear blank. Uh, um, the line at the end is a is a fast-paced frenetic horror yeah. thriller. <laughs> with a, a vampire, eight days in the life of a vampire in the New York City streets and subways, culminating in a, a epic chase, a paragraph about the vampire, a paragraph about the main uh, hero. Uh, we look forward to your kind attention. Uh, thank you for reading this. Um, and so put that one page query letter 
with Ted Klein's letter of recommendation for me in an envelope, went to the Staten Island Ferry, handed it to Craig. <laughs> uh, he went into town and roller skated to 666 Fifth Avenue, which is where Bantam was located on the 25th floor. <laughs> um, went up the elevator, went into the lobby of Bantam, hands the receptionist the envelope and says, uh, letter for Lou Aronica, who was the editor. The receptionist says, is he expecting this? Craig says, I don't know, sign here. And just had her sign his messenger manifest. <laughs> uh, half an hour later, Lou, the editor, comes walking out to go have lunch with somebody, with a writer. The receptionist says, um, letter for you. He's like, what is it? She says, I don't know, here. So she hands it to him. He goes to lunch to meet the, a writer who never shows up. So it's just him and this letter, which yeah. he says he read like 30 times, comes back and immediately calls me where yeah. I'm at home just starting to retype the book into past tense. Yeah, I took the day off from work to, to start doing that and calls me and says, I want to see uh, um, the book. Yeah. I'm like, fuck. So, uh, uh, spent the entire weekend retyping the entire yeah. 380 page uh, novel into past tense uh, and handed it in. Craig's there like uh, changing words in pencil in the margins and stuff. Um, <laughs> but I'm, you know, it, it's just basically he had to turn every is into a was and every yeah. uh, uh, does into a did. And, you know, that was just it, just retyping mechanically, yeah. retyping the entire thing um, with white out for when I fucked up. Um, and yeah, and then we got a, a deal and all of a sudden we didn't have to be street messengers anymore. Uh, yeah. And uh, That's a great story. Damn. Uh, the book gets optioned and a year, year and a half later it comes out. Uh, it got optioned a year before it came out uh, for film and then uh, sold a million copies and all of a sudden we went from broke messengers to New York Times bestselling authors. Yeah. Just, you know, it's like that. Beautiful thing, man. It's just, um, yeah. So, so that's that story. What were we talking about? Collaborating. Yeah, just like collaborate. I mean, obviously, yeah, it worked out pretty well for both of you with that with that book, definitely. You know, and and you know, and again, we were used to jamming. Yeah, you know, we were used to jamming, throwing riffs back and forth, and and uh, jamming story is like jamming music. Totally, you know, it really is. You're just throwing shit back and forth. It's like, oh, well, this is cool. What if this? You know, what if it goes like this? Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, as a writer, I've always, uh, enjoyed the musicality of prose. Yeah. I, I, I think a lot like a drummer in terms of rhythm, yeah. you know, and, and just the propulsiveness on the page, making it move. So all the music metaphors are, are totally there and, and inform the shit. And then, you know, and then it goes backwards where, uh, uh, music, you know, when I write lyrics, generally it's like I start just singing notes at the chords mm -hmm. and just sort of singing phonetically and making mouth noises and hitting notes. And then I sort of stumble on melodies. And then I go back and listen yeah. to the recording and go, oh, that's what I was trying to say. Uh, that, that noise sounds like this word, which makes this sentence, which makes this and all of a sudden I know what the oh, fuck cool. is happening. I, I like to write that way musically where I'm just <laughs> focusing on the sound and the phonetics. Like, it's almost like I'm a lyrical poet. I'll worry about what it means later and I'll listen yeah. back. Yes. I totally do the same thing. And I, cause yeah. it's so much about that melody and the beat with, with songwriting. It's different than prose that way. It's yes. and how do I feel when I'm singing it too? Yes. That, that's more important than what I'm actually saying in some weird way. It's Absolutely. Like, how does it sound and how does it feel to me? Then I'll worry about the lyric itself. But yeah, I know that's cool. I, I, I'm the same way when, when approaching that, yeah. And, and the lyrics will tell me what they wanna be eventually. You know, yeah. uh, you know, we were talking about this the other day, just like um, the song will tell you what it wants. Yes. And the song, will, the song does write itself. You're just here to, to do it. You know, yeah, I mean, that's the interesting, 
like thing. And I, I think about that. Does the, you know, is it coming from me or is, is this some other thing I'm tapping into? I don't really know the answer to that. Honestly, I think it's a bit of both. I yeah. think it's like these ancient, like it's like almost like an ancient melody and they're almost like spirits in a weird way. I know I'm sounding like very new agey, but, but it is like a melody is like a weird spirit. And, it, and this is interesting. Like when you, when, when the song changes, like you revise it, it, it feels like, and the melody changes. I feel like I have like a ghost of a melody and it's weird how like they both kind of battle out, you know, yeah. when you're trying to get, get the song out. And yeah, no, it's, I mean, I don't know. I think songwriting is the, I remember Norman Mailer, he's like novel writing is a spooky art. I always feel like songwriting for me, at least, is like the real spooky art where, you know, novel, it's like, okay, I'm clocking in, let's get this going. Uh, I don't know. What is it like for you? Um, you know, because I think of them all as one contiguous media, hmm. um, but the, I mean, the forms are completely different. Yes. Um, I, I totally uh, get the spookiness of music because it really is, I think we're simultaneously uh, receivers and transmitters Yeah. Uh, because we're part of the enormous energy system of, mm -hmm. uh, of infinite subatomic vibration that is yeah. the all yeah. that is of the universe and all creation. Um, so we're just tapping into shit, but we're also very specific um, uh, translators. You know, it's like, my music is not your music. It's not anybody else's music. Everybody, everybody vibrates at their own frequency, and they get their own uh, angle on it. Um, and that's just how it works. I mean, that's the yeah. great thing about playing with other people. It's like all of a sudden, uh, uh, these vibrations set each other off in the room, and one of them's banging on drums, and one of them's uh, playing guitar, and maybe one's on keyboards, and somebody's singing, and all this shit is happening, and it's amazing. Uh, um, writing and particularly writing by yourself but even when i'm collaborating i'm not sitting in the same room with them hardly ever you know uh even when specter and i were locked in uh in his attic and writing uh for months like on the bridge or something mm. uh i was in one room and he was in the next room oh, and the door was open but but you know you're in your own space writing is a solitary act it really is yeah but it's still that same uh, um, reception and transmission thing where when I'm in the zone, it's pouring out. And when I'm not in the zone, um, then I'm just, when the words aren't coming, that means there's something I don't know yet. Mm. So I have to figure out what the thing is. Um, and that either is research and just going, oh, I don't know about this particular subject enough to to speak accurately about it or like uh yeah when when autumn and i were, were working on a piece um and a woman loses a whole bunch of blood and i was trying to figure out how much blood does she lose how much blood do you lose uh before you black out yeah and how much blood do you lose before you die how, how much blood do you have in you and how much uh, blood loss takes you to what levels of, of, of consciousness? You've got to know that answer before you can keep the story going. Before I could do the scene. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, so basically, then I, I go and research, okay, uh, uh, there's this many pints of blood in a human body. This is how many you lose. Yeah. So then I went and got uh, some measuring cups and got the amount of water uh, uh, oh, wow. that would be the amount of gallons and went out in the middle of the street and poured them to see how big the circle was how how far the blood would flow uh now of course, water water does not have the right same there. consistency as as blood but you get the general idea yeah, you get the idea that's uh, really cool because then I, I needed to know uh this woman is laying on the floor yeah. in this big pool of blood and this other woman who's been shot uh is bleeding out in a different way uh and how far apart did they physically need to do and at what point do their blood pools converge and i needed to see all of that yeah. precisely in order to get the scene right that but, tells me how much of a filmmaker you are mm -hmm. you know, that's such a filmmaking like 
knowing some directors and stuff like that is how a direct i mean writers think like that too but the, that attention to detail where i must visually get it right is very that just shows that there there's a definite filmmaker in you as long as along uh, along with as a writer you know it, but the thing is if you write it like that then even if i don't direct it the director will know what the director will see it, I gave it to screenwriting you. it's like perfect way to get your blueprint as solid as possible. That's really cool. Like I, you know, that just that attention to detail for those like scenes, especially because I know you teach, you teach the, um, what is it like an action or fighting for the Lithuania. choreography of yes. violence. Yes, that's yes. it. Thank you. And that just shows why you're so good. It's like you and um, another, uh, he's very good. At, he's a literary writer, but uh, Marlon James is extremely okay. good at writing violence. I mean, he's like coming from the literary thing. He's interesting. He said, he said that in America, like literary people don't like to look at the violence. He's like, that's an American bullshit thing. That's, you know, whether it be literary or horror, like that's, yeah, exactly. It's looking, it's like, no, it's, it, you got to show it. You gotta literally show it and let the reader fucking feel and see that, you know. So it's but the detail of the violence is very detailed with his violence. Yeah. I I love the precision. And again, you don't have to show everything, but you should you should know everything and that yeah. will tell you what you need to say. You that's, know, that's that really that's really cool, cool craft advice right there. You know, that that attention to detail, like just to the that I'm gonna even be like take some, you know, make a science project out of it, basically. Right. That's really awesome. That's really awesome. So, so and, yeah. And it's cool because it, then you have a visual frame of reference. I also, I mean, I, I really like um, writing to location, even if it's just for prose. If, you know, if, if it's for film, I really want to know what the dimensions of the room are because mm. then I know where to put the camera and where to put yeah. the lights and and uh, where everybody is standing vis-a-vis -vis everybody else. And yeah, I, I want to be able to measure in footsteps how close somebody is and just because then you can shoot it, right? But, but, but I want to be able to see that in the prose. And I've always, you know, when I write, I'm watching the movie in my head, you know, uh, and, and I am the camera and I am the action and I am the, you know, I am the blood that hits the floor. Right, yeah. um, but, but having that sort of spatial concreteness just that that real sense of of physicality uh just grounds everything yeah. you know it just really grounds it it's like wow okay yeah i can i i can taste this fucking place you know yeah uh, and then all the details are, are just that much more vivid Chris, and yeah. i've always written like that i mean that that was always uh and i don't know you know i would had no ambitions to be a filmmaker but uh, I think between writing and drawing, uh, sense of space, just, you know, wow. And this is, what, this is what the mouth is going to be doing when you stab him in the lung, you know, and it's going to be, ah, you know, yeah. uh, just, you know, knowing, knowing what it'll the look specificity like. yeah. of it, the, the detail of it. To me, that's like the fucking party. Yeah, that's, that's what the, yeah. I remember, I remember at a, uh... Uh, it was bizarre. I don't know if you were there for that. It was one of the people you've worked with. It was uh, Violet was on it. Violet mm. was up. And uh, man, it was it was just epic. This is it was her. Oh God. Um, um, the only good Indian. I'm, his, I'm Stephen Steve. Graham Jones. Thank yeah. You. And I forget who else. It might have. I forget who else it was. But it was they were on it on this thing called uh, getting yourself and the audience off. And it's one of the best right. like. Panel. Were you there for that? Yes, it was. It was great. Uh, it was so good. But yeah, it's just like that's just a way to like get yourself off because you're finding what really gets you excited, and that's going to yeah. totally get your audience excited too. Yeah. So. Well, if it doesn't, then it, it's the wrong audience. But I mean, yeah. it, but if you give them that, they have that. And if yeah. you don't give them that, I mean, if if I'm writing something scary and it doesn't scare me, what are the odds that are going to yeah, scare exactly. anybody else? You got to get yourself off first. You yeah. Gotta, yeah, you got to like, no, nah, it's totally true. If, or else it's like, what's the fucking point? You yeah. Know? You know, it's same with music. I mean, if I'm not humming and getting the song in my brain, like, and it's not living there, maybe it's not the right song. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, hey, what's what? the point here? And I, I'll leave those songs behind. But is there anything sadder than boring yourself while playing music? I mean, that, that seems like hell to me. 
Yeah. It seems like that. What's the? It might as well be a cover band then. You know. Yeah. Songs you don't yeah. want. At least you get paid. You know. <laughs> but and, and I, I've done that. Yeah. You've probably yeah. done that too. Uh, I, I was regaling uh, Garrett Cook the other day with the story of when I was in a lounge band. Uh, when I was uh, oh, in the, okay. at the oh, age of 16, oh, I was yeah. playing like VFW posts and shit because yeah. I was the guy who knew how to, uh, I was the bass player who could learn the songs like this. Like that, yeah. And, uh, and just uh, playing Caravan with a drum solo uh, in a band led by a one na- one-legged war vet named Louie um, <laughs> uh, with cigarette smoke so thick yeah. uh, that, I mean, you, you could just basically slice it and eat it as as meringue. Um, and yeah, I mean, I had fun playing that shit, but it was the worst music I ever played. Yeah. And uh, I mostly had fun just because I was 16 years old. I'm in a bar and I can't yeah, believe that it. That sounds pretty fun, actually. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I got thrown out of, of, of bands when they found out how old I was. Uh, but... Yeah, it's it's sort of like being a it's like being Tracy Lords, you know, uh, <laughs> years old getting into porn. It's like no, I I totally I can totally play Rolling Stones. I can totally yeah. play this, and then like uh, my mom shows up uh, at eleven o'clock and pulls me out of the bar. Um. <laughs> That's pretty great, man. That's pretty great. I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna pause here because I gotta take I gotta pee and we'll keep oh, no going. Five, four, three, two one all right we're back so i'm done peeing let's keep it going so you were saying now we're just back. about like playing in cover bands like uh yeah, playing right. caravan with a drum solar uh uh with a one-legged guitar player named louis at a vfw pose uh do you know what song caravan is it's like the lounge one da, 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 oh yeah, yeah yeah i know that melody yeah da, 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 da. Boom, 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 boom. This is actually a cool ass song. Yeah. Um, um, we, we we closed out every night with Caravan and the drum drummer would get to play <laughs> a drum solo, uh, which is like a drum solo if you pronounce it funny. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that was super fun. But uh, that's like the boringest ass. There there were songs we were playing that were so fucking dull. Yeah. Uh, no, that's just and, not. And that really is like hell, you know, yeah. playing boring music. It's just not fun, man. It's just, yeah, no. Kill me. I'm curious too, because it's like, I remember talking to you. This might have been when we when I we shared a room, I think. Yeah, yeah. And we were talking and you said something about you were going to record something in the 90s, but it was when like grunge was huge and what you were doing was like not in... Can you refresh me on this story? I've, I've been meaning to ask you about this. Yeah. Um, so I wound up, okay, so it's like 94. Yeah. Skip and Spectre have just broken up. So this um, is after like you guys did, did a bunch of books and you, you started Splatterpunk to some degree. And yeah, so you're kind yeah. of, you focus more on music now or are you just like, you're where, where are you at? Like, I'm curious. Oh, well, um, we moved to Hollywood uh, yes. to be uh, famous Hollywood screenwriters and so forth. And that was a fucking disaster. Yeah. And uh, I had a nervous breakdown and I crashed and burned. Uh, so I'm, uh, and uh, Craig and I broke up. Uh, my family and I broke up. Uh, basically my life just totally went to shit. And I, uh, I went- Dark time. Say what? The dark time, a dark time. Oh yeah, but I, I totally uh, bottomed out. It was like, um, um, yeah, basically, I got this tiny little shithole apartment in Hollywood uh, and just curled up in a fetal ball and screamed for a year and a half, uh, sort of like a, a dog that gets hit by a car and then just crawls under a porch to die. But I kept yeah. not dying. Um, gotcha. And um, so you, know, you had the high, then came the fucking low. Oh, yeah. No. And, and, it, and it was super fucking low. And like I'm laying there, like literally curled up in a fetal ball, screaming on the floor of this shithole apartment. Uh, and part of me is like, I want to die. God, I want to die. God, I want to die. And part of me is like, but did you hear that note you just hit? That was fucking nuts. That <laughs> screaming. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I, I, I found my voice in my nervous breakdown. I found all the notes hmm. that I didn't know I had when my soul cracked open and uh, and 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 spilled out like goo. Um, and so then at a certain point, 
I'm like, it was April Fool's Day, 1994. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I wake up and I'm like, God, I don't like to ask you for things because I feel stupid, but I just want you to know that if I don't get a band to play in, like right now, I'm going to fucking spontaneously combust. Just letting you know. <laughs> thank you. Um, and my friend Mark Leventhal, uh, who I wound up writing the Emerald Burrito yep. of Oswald, great, a great books, later, yeah. um, who I'd just become friends with, he lived about a quarter mile down the road. Um, and he was in a, a punk band called Nailed. Uh, Mark's a great musician. He's an amazing yep. musician. Uh, and uh, he was in this band and I was like, okay, I've got like $4 in the world right now. I'm completely bottomed out. I'm going to go over to his house. Uh, I'm going to buy two bagels, a little thing of tomato juice and a little thing of cream cheese. And I'm going to knock on his door and I'm going to beg him to let me be in his band. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll like play broom. I don't care. I yeah. just need to be in a band. Yeah. So I, I walk down the road, I go to the grocery store, I buy the aforementioned bagels, cream cheese, and tomato juice, knock on his door, he's not there. I go back to my place, and I eat the bagels, and I drink the tomato juice, and then my phone rings, and it's this woman named Carol, this amazing singer, big black mama, voice like an angel. Yeah. Uh, I had met her while almost getting uh, beaten to death by homophobes on a Hollywood Boulevard with baseball bats one night and I went into a bar and met her. And um, um, she's like, you don't have any food, do you? And I said, no. She says, you don't have any money either, do you? And I said, no. She said, I'm gonna come over and buy you some food. So she comes over and uh, we go to a grocery store and we're in the salad dressing aisle when the earthquake hits. And uh, all of a sudden, salad dressing is rocketing off the the uh, shelves like you know like yeah. fired out of cannons and uh, carol's eyes go as big as softballs and she starts to run but i start laughing because my life is so fucked up at this point it's like oh and now an earthquake bring it on you know fucker <laughs> and i'm just laughing and i grab her and uh, we go back to and then she's like and then the earthquake stops it's only like a couple of seconds but it's huge and loud and crazy and she's like, and now everything's like shattered all over the floor. She's like, what should we do? And I'm like, let's finish shopping. So she bought me $40 worth of food. We go back to my place. She's like, man, I would really like to smoke some pot. And I'm like, me too. So she calls a friend of hers who has some pot, who's a bass player and a singer, beautiful bass player and a singer. And her boyfriend is a drummer. Mm. So we go over to her place and uh, meet her and uh she's really nice she says her boyfriend will be back in a minute he comes in from walking the dog he's this cool long-haired dude um and um we start smoking a joint and he goes you guys don't know any singers do you because we just had to fire our singer and carol goes points at me and says he's one and mark poland the drummer is like yeah 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 so he smokes some more pot and he puts some music on and uh, he starts playing percussion along with it. I picked up his girlfriend's bass and start playing along. It was the, uh, the first album by Brad. Um, and um, at the end of the album, he's like, okay, okay, let's hear it. I had brought, I grabbed a cassette of music I'd recorded in, in New York just before everything blew up. Yeah. Uh, threw the cassette in, he listens to it. 30 seconds in, he picks up the phone, says, Chris, Chris, listen to this holds the phone up to the speakers and it goes, okay, I'll call you right back. Hangs up the phone and says, okay, so here's the deal, man. We rehearse five times a week, four hours a day. Uh, we share all the songwriting credits, blah, blah, blah. Goes from complete disinterest to like, okay, so here's, <laughs> here's how it works. That's how music when can you get, It was yeah. amazing. When can, when can we get together? I, uh, I said, well, right now? Yeah. Picks up the phone. Chris, can we get together right now? No, tomorrow? Okay, listen to this. Okay, talk to you later. Hangs up the phone. Next day we go. Turns out that Mark's brother Chris was Chris Poland, uh, the original guitarist uh, 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 in Megadeth, along with Mustaine. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, you know, Peace Sells and but who's buying and you know yeah. that era, just monster guitar player. Yeah. 
Mark is a monster drummer. Um, um, the bass player uh, was a monster bass player whose dad is a, a famous uh, jazz musician uh, uh, who started the Baked Potato Jazz Club in, in Los Angeles. Yeah. And had played with Stevie Nicks and blah, 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 blah. Dave Randy. And um, <clears throat> I met the guys. And then we jammed for uh, a couple hours, um, came up with three songs in like a four hour period. Chris was recording all of it. Um, and uh, then he made a cassette for me of one of the songs um, and said, we can't rehearse tomorrow, but I'll, uh, we'll see you on, uh, on Wednesday or whatever, uh, you know, day after. Um, Little did I know they were auditioning another singer the next day and that's why I couldn't come. Um, but while they were doing that, I took that song and wrote the words for it. So when they brought me in uh, the next day and said, okay, we're recording the song, this is your audition. Yeah. I had all the words and I sang it to him and we were a band like that. And uh, the band was called Mumbo's Brain. Mumbo's Brain. And again, playing with Chris Poland, who's like a certified guitar genius. Yeah. Uh, just absolute absolute brilliant writer and and performer uh and the whole band was so good and my job was basically uh um they would lay down chord progressions generally it would start with chris and um i would just start singing they would uh record it and then i'd go home and write the words Two front man. I, yeah that's pretty good that's a pretty good gig yeah, we, we wrote like 50 songs together. We got to open for Todd Rundgren at the House of Blues. We got to play festivals with like uh, Social Distortion and No Doubt and uh, surf That's punk sweet. stuff. But we didn't get to gig nearly enough and then we broke up and that was that. Um, yeah. um, and then I played very briefly in like a uh, electronic band more towards... Uh, the Nine Inch Nails slash Nitzareb yeah. kind of uh, uh, zone. Type of shit, yeah. Um, and that lasted very, very short. It was a band called Damage Control, but it was unable to control its own damage. <laughs> um, and then I just fucking dropped out of music. Yeah. I, 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 I haven't done a band since, and that was 96, I guess. It's rough, man. I'd say out of all the heartache you know and i'm i'm a you know i'm a i'm a young dude when all said and done but it's like music is just man it's, it can be heartbreaking because you have those relationships and you're dependent on each other and you know and if you don't it's a it's a really it's really like the closest i've ever experienced with the relationship i mean yeah you have writing partners but there's something about a band where you're you're kind of married in a weird way and you know, and if it if it's a good marriage, you're in heaven, and if it's a bad marriage, it's fucking hell times <laughs> infinity. Yeah. You know. Yep, yep, yep. yep. No, th th this is this is all true, and yeah, I mean, um, the last band broke up. We were supposed to open for uh, for Fetus for Jim Thurwell, oh, wow. um, yeah. which I was totally jazzed to do. Yeah. Totally jazzed to meet him and to play on the same stage with him. And uh, one of the band, band members just disappeared in the couple of weeks before. Ask what happened? But yeah, it's just, and that's what's so hard about it. You're, you're dependent on other people. Where with writing, yeah. it's, I mean, yeah, there's the partnership, but you can still write your stories. You know, you can put a John Skip story out and put a novel out if you want for your own. You know, yeah. I don't and, need anybody else to write a book. Don't need anybody else, but with music, especially if you want to do a band, and you don't mm -hmm. need to make music. You don't need a band. But if you want to play, yeah, exactly. But um, shit, this is my entire studio. Yeah. No, and you're making. I mean, I was gonna get to that. Like, you've really become. I mean, I would say, when did it start? Your passion for music has just been like the forefront the last few years. I've noticed. When when have you really get got back to it? Like, when did you really jump hard? Because you're like you've jumped hard into it, especially since the pandemic. I've noticed. Well, here's what happened. Um, at the beginning of the year, um, like the very beginning of the year, like, like uh, I think starting December 28th, yeah. um, 
and uh, and through February, I wrote a screenplay, uh, original screenplay for a film I want to direct, um, and I'm going to direct um, a feature called uh, Doppelbanger, uh, and um, and it turns out that it had 14 songs in it, hmm. and um, so there's a bunch of musical, either musical numbers or uh, songs that are playing as the story is going on. Music going is, a, on, yeah. is a huge M music, part of what's yeah. going on. That's cool. Um, um, including like several scenes at a karaoke bar. So I have to write all the good and bad karaoke music. Yeah. Um, um, but I finished it up and the pandemic was starting to warm up. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm like, if I'm gonna be locked up in here, I need a recording studio. I had nothing. I had that keyboard behind me and a guitar that was missing strings. That's what I had. Yeah. Um, and um, so I did some research and just went, I'm gonna have to fucking spring for uh, a little MacBook Pro with GarageBand already in it because I need something that's already set up that I don't need to like try and figure out how to make it work. I can just sit down and start making things. Okay. Um, and so um, I decide, okay, I'm gonna go do this. Um, I'm just gonna go to the Best Buy and pick one up. And all of a sudden on my screen, this image flashes saying, uh, Governor Kate has just shut down Oregon. All the stores are closed, all the restaurants are closed, everything is closed for the pandemic. I go, fuck! And I run downstairs, I jump in my car, I blast to the Best Buy, which is like 12 minutes away. I scream into the parking lot, I jump out, I run up to the store and they're like, you can't come in, the store is closed. And I'm like, no! And he's like, but if you know what you want, we'll bring it out to you and sell it to you. And I'm like, yes! So I told him <laughs> what I wanted and, uh, got this little fucking MacBook Pro with the garage band in it. Um, um, then I went to this music store that they let me into and I bought this little keyboard yeah. and, um, and that was it. Uh, and I spent that day learning, just learning everything that I could about garage band. And the next day I wrote my first piece of music. And then from there, I uh, sometimes for the first two months was writing like three pieces of music a day, just like yeah, 12 hours a day in the studio making shit up and then making up another thing and then making up another thing and orchestrating it and just getting the ropes of it. Um, and then I wrote the entire soundtrack, all 16 songs and the uh, incidental music for my movie. Uh, uh, then I wrote a soundtrack for Josh Mallerman's online streaming novel, Carpenter's Farm. I did 45 minutes worth of, of soundtrack music for his book um, uh, that was posted as his chapters were being posted. Um, and I've written like four hours worth of music since March. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, and, and finished like 78% of it. Uh, which is that's really good, people. man. That's yeah. that's that's like being in the. I mean, I relate. I mean, I I just went. I've been writing, and I've been. I mean, I, I my main thing is like editing and publishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's like music just really. It just took me over this past year. You know, I just I needed it. It was there for yeah. me. Um, it's come back full force for me. Um, I almost like. It's weird. Like for me, it's like I just write for like mental health, honestly. I'm just like, I sure. need to do this. This just keeps me sane. I don't even care that much about, um, you know, whether I sell a lot or not. I mean, I do it. I just do it and, you know, chips fall where they may. Music's yeah. kind of become my main passion again. It's weird. It's like, that's my, I just need to do this. I need that band. I'm in that part of my life where I need a band. I related to your story. I'm like, mm -hmm. I needed that band and I'm lucky I found it. I found it with the editor. I uh the drummer because we need that we need a drummer and as a dude I edit it and publish he's like yeah I'm a good drummer and I'm like holy shit this guy's really good so yeah he's really good man uh, I just yeah. I just want <laughs> I just want to play shows so bad now that's where I'm at I want to play shows so bad 
So that will be beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. When, when I can, yeah. So I'm right now, I'm a total one man band. That, that yeah. That's it. Um, I did have a, an old buddy of mine from the Philadelphia Ch Children's Orchestra from way back. Wow. He, 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 uh, he bust me a couple of uh, bass tracks and, and one guitar track that's uh, cool. a couple of months ago. And that was a really fun exchange. That's fun. Um, and a genius sax player um, named Gavin Templeton, who was my neighbor in Los Angeles. Um, he, he laid down some baritone sax for me for a song called uh, Don't Run When the Devil Comes which uh, totally feels like morphine. It's a total morphine-like nice. sound. Nice. Uh, and, and that's cool. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's just me and, and my fucking garage band. Do you, um, do you think you will, you know, God willing, all this comes to an end? And I think it will. I think it will near the end of this year. I think in the fall, I think yes. it will open up. That's, that's my personal feelings and my hopes. Um, will you start, would you, will you try to play these live, you think? You know what I would really, really like to do? Um, um, particularly you write some good songs. Like I've, I've, I, I hear them on, on a, what's, a, what's the platform, which I need to start using. A, SoundCloud. SoundCloud, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been basically keeping my musical diary there. None of my motion picture stuff is there, but, but a lot of the other stuff is up there. And yeah. just, you know, uh, songs and instrumentals and soundscapes um it's basically like my my soul diary um and it's also you know playing every style of music uh from electronic uh to just guitar and, and uh and bass uh you know uh rock songs yeah. funk songs uh electronic songs you had one um, that really reminded i think you even said it reminded you of the beatles I, was, I think that was my favorite one i can't remember the name of the song do you know it's called the antidote to fear yeah i uh, that's a, i think that's my favorite out of the ones i've heard cool. i really like that one a lot i like that, that one a lot. Did, did, did you hear tragic which i just released about a week and a half ago it's 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 like a two and a half minute song that's structured like an elvis costello song i don't think um, i've heard that one yet i'll have to go check it out yeah, yeah. That, sounds, that sounds really cool. Tragic. Yeah, it, it's really stripped down. Uh, uh, I love Elvis Costello, yeah. man. He's he's the best. Oh yeah, yeah, that sounds. And, and this is like early Elvis Costello, like Armed Forces yeah. era. Yeah. You know, cool. no solos, no nothing. It's just, yeah. uh, and, and the way he he structures a a verse so that in this particular song, there's no chorus. It's just that the last line of the verse. Uh, is and I just think it's tragic, tragic, and then you go straight into the next thing. So, so the chorus is built into Ooh. the verse structure uh, in that cool. way, and, I like and that's that. a very Elvis kind of trick. Yeah, that is that is very Elvis. So, uh, I and you were um, you were saying one thing that I, I wanted to go back to you that it's all the same, and I, I found that interesting. Like all, it's all from the same place. I'm curious about that as we kind of get near the end of the show. Like, what do you mean by that? Like the music, the writing, the directing. Tell me about that. I'm curious. Yeah, I see it all as one contiguous media. Basically, it, it's um, it's different ways of expressing the same thing, mm. which is the thing that's pouring out of you. Yeah. And sometimes it's words, and sometimes it's sounds, and sometimes it's pictures, and sometimes it's all of the above. Uh, sometimes it's uh, just taking the fast food container uh, that I just got the rest of my meal on, drawing a couple of eyeballs on it and turning it into a puppet for the rest of the day, which you probably yeah. see me do. Um, you know, but it's, it's all just, uh, it, these are all just conduits of expression of essentially the same ingredients, which is everything that you have to say as a human spirit that wants to pour out of you. Um, no. So ha having, having a big palette where I can, you know, play in, yes. in different ways. Uh, music does a different thing from words. Uh, uh, film does a different thing from, you know, screenwriting is as different from prose writing yes. as it is from haiku. You know, yes. it's like they're, they're completely different formal styles that have these demands of you. Uh, and just being able to play with all of that. And then again, to be able to, um, to do something uh, that feels like a space uh, symphony and then do something that feels like, uh, you know, 
talking heads and then do something that feels like Neil Young and then do something that feels like Santana and then do something that feels like uh, fucking Sigur Ross. Yeah. You know, uh, just to be able to- Go with what feels right. I think that's really what it comes down to from what I'm hearing from you, just what feels right to me, how do I want to express it? And the rest is yeah. like, whatever. It's like, that's not the point, you know? And, and then you're stretching all of these muscles. Yeah. You know, uh, and I think it just, you know, to the point where it's like, I can play anything I can think of that my fingers or voice can catch up with. Like right now I'm, I'm studying jazz chords, which mm. are really intense yes. because, you know, your basic chords have like three or four notes in them, Yeah, you know? Uh, your 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 tonic, your third and your fifth, and then maybe you throw a seven in or something like yeah. that. Jazz chords, they're like eight to ten notes per chord. Yeah, it's, it's they're ridiculously dense and rich, and like if you play that ten note chord, the entire riff is right there in the structure of the chords. All you got to do is noodle your fingers, and all of a sudden you're taking a jazz lick because. Yeah it's all built into the structure. And it's all these like, you know, uh, minor six with a nine and a 13 on yeah. top or something. Yeah. It's like, wow, okay, now I know what a six uh, and a nine and a 13 look like next to each other yeah. with, a, with a minor on it. And then like a moo chord where you're playing a second. And these complicated things are taking it to like another weird yanking level for me right now. Hmm. Uh, Cause I never, did that before yeah um yeah i've not I, really delved into jazz myself my guitar player who you've heard he can do all that shit he's just like he's yeah. a monster that dude's yeah. really a good that player. plays really good but yeah no i i, I kind of just <laughs> I, 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 i'm just playing my bass and singing my songs you know but yeah, yeah i'm trying to learn more on piano though i wrote one song on piano so i'm trying to get more into piano now that's like my next thing but piano yeah. is so cool it is because all all the notes are there Yes. And they're spread out for you two-handed. That's, that's what I like about it. It's fun. It's, it's intimidating, complete. but really fun. And I'm just kind of having fun with it, you know. Um, I, I'm taking lessons. I'll tell you. Um, because I've never been able, I've never been a keyboard player until this last year. Yeah. Uh, and now I'm doing like tons of keyboards. It was because I got to learn how to do this. And all my life I've wanted to, to yeah. learn how to do it. And now I'm finally doing it. So I'm taking this class right here. I don't know if you can see it. It's For called... those that are just listening, it's piano in a flash. Probably, that sounds cool. Piano in a flash. I would actually uh, take, I'd check that out. That sounds cool. It, it's, it's really fascinating because what he yeah. does, you, you don't have to learn to read music and able to do this stuff. Yeah. He, he's taking it at the very simple, would you like to just be able to play nice songs that you like yeah. anytime yeah. you want? Uh, and I mostly am, was taking this to get my right and left hands together. Yeah, that's the toughest part of piano. That's the toughest part. It really is the toughest uh, part. Uh, I was able to do it with drums, get my hands and feet yeah. coordinated and everything. But keyboards, just because playing playing two different melodies at the same time just makes my brain go like this. Me too. Me too. It's very hard. Um, as a guy who's played only really bass and I played keyboard is weird, but I, I I just kind of was like I I played a keyboard in a band, but it was like a goth it was a goth band. I just basically made noise candy like goth stuff. Right? Like I didn't really yeah. wasn't that serious, but yeah, I mean it's it's an it's my next instrument I want to get into. But yeah, it's a lot. It's a, it's it's a challenge. It's a fun challenge, piano. And it's keyboard. such a fun challenge, man. I'm it having really such is. a good time. And again, yeah, now I'm writing soundtrack for this music for this uh, movie may not be in the movie but I'm writing it uh, th this is uh, my book Conscience which yeah. I published a, a number of years ago mm -hmm. um, um, we're doing this movie through uh, Josh Mallerman's production company Spin a Dark, Dark Yarn yeah and uh, they're doing cool uh, shit a they did a of, Max Booth's uh, uh, book recently I know it's they just did Max's thing yeah yeah it's cool it's, yeah. it's a beautiful thing you know seeing a kind of D DIY you know with Mallerman he's He's really done a, gr a great job of being kind of a, a new ambassador for for horror. I mean, he's just really doing an, an awesome job, and also a fellow a fellow uh, musician he's writer too with his with his band. So yeah, I mean, he's, he's killing it. He's a cool dude. He, he uh, 
he's such a cool dude and, and i mean his art is coming completely from the right place we we yeah. we understand each other so well um he just wrote the intro for my new book that yes, we're about to publish the new book that we're publishing i actually wanted to mention um not only that but uh I think this is it's very rare that I'm going to have somebody who not only is a musician and a writer, but also an editor and publisher. I wanted to talk about that for a little bit before we before we head on out. So, for sure, you know, that's it. And it's tough, man. It's tough to wear all these hats at time. It's like that I feel is the blessing and the curse to be gifted to, you know, to want to do so much and then budget the time and the energy and all that stuff. But I mean, you've discovered some really special uh, writers, I think, you know, when all said and done. I mean, Laura Lee Barr, who we were talking about before we went on the show, that was your first book? Yes, no, Laura is absolutely brilliant. Uh, yeah. I met Laura when she auditioned for a music video I was directing as an actress and yeah. uh, she was wonderful. And then I realized that she was also a playwright and, uh, and an actor and uh, then and we became like great friends and then um, uh, and also a, a screenwriter yeah. and then one day she she says I, I wrote this book I spent seven years writing this book would you read it and uh, tell me if it's any good and if it is where I could maybe sell it so I read her book which is called Haunt yeah and I didn't like it I fucking loved it. It's it was so brilliant. Yeah. And I was like, but I don't know who would publish this book um, because it's really weird and it's operating, you know, it's written in past, present, and, no, first, second, and third person. Yeah. It was it was amazing. Um, there's all, all this experimentation in it. And um, people would either go, this is wonderful writing, but we don't know what to do with it or how to sell it. Or they would go, well, this is great, but just cut all that weird shit out and then you'll have your just regular nice uh mystery that was what 20 20 2010 2012 i'm trying to right around there yeah yeah around um, there i mean i think like right now you know with my press there really has been in the last like five years or so a real boom of small <laughs> presses doing everything but in 2010 it was still kind of new for small presses to really be doing yeah. stuff and you did obviously fungasm you know starting with yeah. that book and well, yeah, I mean, uh, Rose O'Keefe of, of Eraserhead, yeah. basically, uh, because I felt that this was Bizarro, but it wasn't the Bizarro that, yeah. that they were doing. This was no. really a, another, a, a, another. I don't want to say order of magnitude, but a, a, it was surfing different weird waves. It was. Um, and so, uh, yeah, she gave me the, uh, the Fungasm imprint to be able to do that. Um, and then I was able to publish Violet Lavoie. And yeah. I was able to publish Autumn Christian and collaborations with Cody yeah. and um, Danger um, Slater. Is awesome. Danger Slater, my man, yeah. did four books with him. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, Deborah Gray and uh, S. G. Murphy. Best. Yeah, Deborah's amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, Jennifer Robin, mm -hmm. uh, S. G. Murphy, and uh, John Bowden. I, I think that's that's everybody. Oh, and yeah. Heather Drain and I did the bizarre. Oh, yeah. Was, no, nice, volume, love, volume yeah. That's a cool, um, that's a cool book. So yeah, uh, did a handful of titles working with really really great people. Yeah. I hope they all are able to um, um, run from there. Uh, and again, yeah, did I mention Autumn Christian? Yeah. Uh, She's, she's pretty yeah. great. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm a big fan. We published her as well. You know, she's the best. I mean, she's the she best. And so yeah. brilliant. Wow. I, I feel a kindred thing with you because you I'm the same way of like the artists I work with. Like I'm rooting for them to go into big, bigger places and do bigger things. Like I'm all I'm the same way. You know, I'm proud of class and you know. But yeah, I think that's a good way for to be like. Okay, here's your start. You can stay or you can run. Like I'm good with yeah. either. Yeah, and that's yeah. a good way I to mean, be a publisher and editor. Yeah. If I could take them all the way, I would, but I think that I'm like a gateway drug uh, in, in that sense. <laughs> you know, it's sort of yeah. like I find these amazing people and help get them attention and then uh, they do their yeah. thing. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of the point of the small to mid sized press to some degree, whether they stay with that or whatever, because they're so publishing is just so fucking risk averse mainstream publishing like big yeah. bullshit they're so risk averse 
There's so, and it's getting harder and harder for new voices to break out, even in the small press world, because it's, it's crowded. It's crazy. So yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's really important, you know, to do that. Um, And yeah, I feel, you know, we're, we're kindred spirits in that way. Both of us definitely have also found uh, a lot of new women writers, you know, like Lindsay Lerman and, you know, and and I think that's, it's cool. I mean, we're very blessed to have done that while we push our own passions of art and I mean, music and writing, you know, I mean, I, it's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's one of those things, you know, it's, that, it's art, man. Yeah. I, I consider an myself an artist. Yeah. You know? same, same. I'm an artist. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm uh, a serious artist working in popular and unpopular weird forms. Same, same. I, I would relate completely to that. I would say as we kind of sum, sum this up, cause you, you know, you got that experience, you know, and, you know, there'll be a lot of what they call Zoomers and millennials listening to, you know, and watching this show. What would be your kind of, hey, I don't want to sound cheesy, like words of wisdom, but kind of just your, well, you, you tell young artists, you know, maybe, maybe in their 20s or early 30s, you know, like that are scared, they're nervous, they're weird, they want to express themselves. What, what do you have like advice or just some words of wisdom or anything like that? I'm you know? crawling with of uh, words of wisdom um yeah that, that come in that i don't right to sum this up because i feel like you do you you've been there and done that i love that about you skip like and you and you give back to the to the to, you always give back to the to the new writers and encourage so yeah just kind of some lay it on us <laughs> you know basically i think what it comes down to is this uh if you've got stuff something that you're burning to communicate uh that wants out let it out, do it, you know, and have as much fun as you can doing it because otherwise what is the fucking point? But, um, you know, not that all art is, you know, made for laughs. I love laughs, but, you know, even the darkest, most tortured stuff uh, comes from an an urgency and a truth that needs to be expressed. I I, I feel very strongly that art is the best place to put my worst impulses uh, so that I don't actually take them out on human beings in in, in real life. Um, so my advice is, uh, if you are drawn to it, fucking do it. Just fucking do it. Because if you don't do it, nobody else will. Uh, you're the only one of you there is. And the things that are trying to come out of you are not going to come out of anybody else. And if you're dissatisfied with the art that you're seeing, if you watch movies and go, these movies suck, or you read books and go, these books suck, um, what are the criteria by which something that you would think was awesome uh, would live? And then go do that thing, learn how to do it. I love the process of learning how to do shit. And I understand that you don't start out good Everybody talks about how fucking awesome Mozart was because he was composing uh, uh, symphonies when he was like five or something. But at the age of two, he was he sucked. He yeah. sucked. He was like a cat running across a keyboard. He had nothing, right? But he turned into Mozart. You fucking practice and you do your shit. The more you do I it, the better you yeah. get. Exactly. You know, and it's fucking fun. I mean, um, I'm sixty three years old. I have uh, outlived my life expectations by more than twice. Yeah, I, I'm a crazy bastard and I didn't think yeah. I would make 30 and I'm 63, I'll be 64 in a couple of months. And I'm still learning shit and I'm still having fun because it's fucking fun. Yeah. And what else am I going to do? Yeah, you know, exactly. what, what, what is better than telling stories, making weird shit up, making music that that feels like you, that feels like your soul, it feels like uh, um, the stuff that you want to hear. Uh, and what's better than connecting with other people who love that stuff, watching the amazing things that they do and be part of this interactive community of, of creativity, creativity and artistry and meeting all the people who enjoy that shit, who, uh, who feel like they know you because they read you or or heard you or saw what you did and went like that fucking speaks to me at that point you're part of the the dialogue you know the the one long conversation uh that runs throughout your life that is the the current the undercurrent of it and um and that's 
the fucking place to be. You know, that's it's just like uh, that, that. That's where uh, there's a reason to wake up every day because it's humming with this fucking uh, the universe vibrating at frequencies yeah. that you can play with and dance with. And um, so, yeah, okay. Basically, forget everything I said. Don't do it. You don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to mess with that shit. Yeah. Do something boring that you hate. Yeah. Don't do what you love. Yeah. Don't do what you love the most. Don't follow uh, your love. Don't find what makes you happy. Don't use the word don't. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, be be. Go for it. I mean, yeah. you okay. know, why why, why the fuck not? Yeah, I, I agree um, completely. I agree completely. And yeah. and and every time uh, that you do, um, the world becomes a slightly cooler place because you did it um and that goes for everybody who's doing it even the ones who totally suck because if they keep doing it maybe they'll suck less uh you know you keep doing it maybe you get good at it and maybe you get really good at it and it takes time but it's worth it it takes time but it's worth it yeah. And everybody who ever did anything that you loved, every book you ever loved, every piece of art you ever loved, every song or piece of music, somebody had to work on that shit until they were able to do I mean, it. Every single one of those things was made by a human being or group of human beings who figured out how to do it and threw down, and now you have that thing. You want that to stop? Yeah, fuck that, no. Fuck I, that, I, no, I, man. I, I want to swim And it's cool, area. like yourself i mean i'm obviously biased but i think your don't push the button is is one of i don't want to say it's the best thing you've done but it's one of the best things you've done and that's what i will say i can't say that it's the best like it's hard but it is and you know what i mean it's not even about promoting it it's just like it's just you're still doing it you know it's like we still got the passion i mean that's the fucking awesome thing so and you're still making art that really connects and flows you know, I'm an editor and I read a lot of fucking open submission. I'm like, whoa, this is blowing my mind. This is awesome. You know, and that's that's what it's about. It's just keep going and, and you know, getting. So what's fun is I feel like as we wrap up, there's a good shot that the the link will be up by the time the show premieres, uh, you know, oh. online. So I'm hoping we'll have the cover and everything done uh, for- don't How put- good would that be? Yes, that would be great. I think we got a good shot. It's we got about a month. It'll be like a month from now. So yeah. So I think uh, you know, hopefully, if not, audience, it's going to be coming soon. But look, take a look out for you know, don't push the button. Skip push the button. Awesome fucking book. How cool is that? So Josh Mallerman says uh, he thinks it's my best book, but he definitely thinks that it is the most John Skip, John Skip. The, the most John Skip of any John Skip books. I would have fucking agree with that totally. Yeah, I, I agree, agree with that. that the well. most John Skip book I, I've read. So, yeah. on that note, man, thank you so much for being on. This was awesome. This this always this is a special episode. You're one of my one of my heroes in many ways, you know. And and you you've really set a path for a lot of weird artists. So this is just really cool. And I'm I'm just hoping even if it's just one person who's like, oh wow, this guy John Skip's awesome. You know, a young you know doesn't know yes he is <laughs> so yeah thank you so much for doing this show and um yeah take a look out for don't push the button and anything else you want to give a shout out to well um you know if i get to um make conscience this year uh look forward to that um uh the movie doppelbanger um these are the two movies i'm most excited about yeah um Sean King O'Grady, who directed Max Booth's movie, uh, is the director of Conscience. Um, oh, sweet, sweet. Yeah. yeah. So we're keeping it in the family. Um, and I'm probably going to release a two record set of, uh, of the best of my audio uh, experiments, my, my, my musical diary yeah. uh, sometime yeah. this year. I just got to get the bucks together to master it uh, so that it sounds as good as it's supposed to sound. Uh, you know, Garage Band is pretty cool, but uh, you still got to master it. Yes, no, and I, you know that I showed you. Uh, I got to show Skip some of my own music. It's pretty much mastered, and it and sounds I'm, so good, dude. Think, it sounds yeah. so good. Who knows? Maybe, maybe I can. We can talk some other time about uh, you know mastering. Yeah, you know. Um, but 
uh yeah this is awesome <laughs> this is super cool my my wife has to get on to the, we share our zoom so she's got to jump on but yeah this is super say cool. hi to her say hi I to will. Lindsay. i will i'll definitely yeah they're a big fan so thank you so much skip and i'm gonna say you, peace out everybody thank you Bye, for everybody. listening to paragraphs and power chords <laughs>